very much. And that, my friends, is how teamwork works. So thank you very much, Laura. Thank you very much, Xerox representative. Uh, it was an excellent speech. I learned a lot. I'm sure we all learned a lot. A um, uh, little uh, thing that I learned uh, just from her speaking is marketing really is all about passion. If you're passionate about something, you're marketing it. You're, you're the marketer about whatever you're passionate about. Before we call upon our next speaker, I'm going to give you a small little mental exercise just to wake everyone up a little bit. Don't worry, it has nothing to do with smiling. So, what I'm going to you, I'm going to ask you to do, this is something from, that I learned from my professors, from neuroscientists and the like, and I'm sure the next speaker is a very distinguished neuroscientist, he might have more to say about this, but while you're sitting, do me a huge favor. Think, and then move your toes. Everyone do it. Move your toes. Now move your fingers. Now move your toes and your fingers at the same time. Now everyone nod your head. Good. What this is doing is you're stimulating your brain. You're trying to use every little part of your body to try and wake yourself up and become attentive. Not that I should be asking for you to be attentive because there are excellent speakers here right now. Another little thing. If you guys are breathing, the way you breathe is actually very important. A lot of us, as we get older, we start breathing from our heart. But the breathing muscle is the diaphragm. So when you breathe, if your chest is going, be careful. It's your diaphragm that should be moving. Really, it's right here. So that's just a little, little key that I want you guys to understand. I'm going to hang it off to Hira as she introduces our next speaker.
invite and also wonderful hospitality. Um, I think um, it's a fantastic event. I don't really do marketing per se, or I sell anything, but I work on something that does all of this. And what I'm going to do today is to walk you through the actual treasures of brain, human brain, and how different faculties within the brain um, not only allows us to market our product, but also to pick what it is in the market. Um, so uh, I will make it very interactive, so people who are sitting at the back, you know, um, there will be some quiz questions for you as well. Um, but you know, when you think about marketing or selling, we think that these are unique human traits. We did some experiments where we had two monkeys, and these monkeys were in different cages. And right in the middle of the cage hung a rope. Now both of these monkeys had to work to pull the rope. And when they pulled the rope, a bucket full of fruits arrives in one monkey's cage. The other monkey is watching this one. And the monkey takes out one apple and puts it on one side, one banana and puts it on the other side. So the monkey who helped this person where the bucket arrived is actually constantly watching. And then we play a trick. We make one of the banana disappear. And this monkey becomes very selfish. It takes that banana, which is the only one, puts it in its own bucket. The other monkey will never help him again. Even though he is now deprived of banana, but he will not help. So I think in terms of fairness in business deals, even primates know this very well. So that's really one of the points that I like to make. And I'll also walk you through the brain and brain structures, and then how brain allows us to develop technologies and innovative um, you know, procedures that will change the world. And Mr. Kortler defined disruptive technologies. They disrupt our lives. So what the life would really look like in a few years, I will also walk you through that park. And I think we are reaching a point of singularity where by Google's and many others, IBM's that are going down perhaps have the opportunity to come up. So I came from Calgary. This is how it was when I left. And I arrived in Toronto and you beat us one more time. One more time. So this is the squishy stuff that I'm really um, interested in working. We are interested in finding out how a brain works and how to fix it when it goes haywire or when it's damaged. We're also interested in asking the questions, can this brain be now connected with you know, external devices such as robots and also the artificial intelligence and super intelligent devices. The brain is the fastest growing organ in the human body. It actually grows at a rate that is just incredible. There are 30,000 brain cells added every second. And it becomes so large that you can compare brain as, with respect to many other structures. What actually makes your brain function is the brain cells, we call them neurons. And these neurons are unique structures, cells. They are excitable, very special. And these brains are connected with each other through special structures, we call them synapses. So a synapse is a contact point between two brain cells. I am the one who's doing the talking, I'm the pre-synapse. You are receiving this information, you are post-synapse, and this microphone could be the synapse through which we are communicating. These synapses actually form the basis of everything that we do from marketing, from learning and memory, from sales and purchases, and also to have our biases and prejudice in the world market. But these um, synapses actually comprise, make the neuronal circuits, and when these circuits function together, we get what we call the behavior. And that behavior could be an impulsive choice to purchase something or to be able to really think about selling something that you believe in. I'm a very strong believer that medicine and medication is for patient and people, not for profit. Profit always counts. 
But if you make profit the sole mandate, you will soon run out and be in trouble like most other companies. But these brain circuits are really not hardwired. They're highly plastic and they change all the time. And this plasticity allows our brain to accommodate and compensate and change our mind as the field or the market changes. And I will also give you some pretty cool examples of how your brain changes and how your brain makes you biased and prejudice towards one product versus the other. So these synapses, when the brain connects, they actually connect at a very fast rate. There are 30,000 synapses every 10 minutes. So hopefully, by the time you leave this uh, banquet hall, you would have gotten several thousand new synapses courtesy of our guest speaker here, to implanted new ideas in your head, and these ideas now are fostered because of uh, connections that you get in your brain. We also know that many of these circuits in our brain that allows us to make choices are hardwired, but most of these synaptic connections are very dynamic and plastic, and these synaptic connections are driven by epigenetics, which is your environment in which you actually function. We've been able to map all of these brain circuits. This is the hippocampus, which is actually one of the most critical part of your brain that allows you to process learning and memory. And if there are any issues with your hippocampus, for example, degeneration of brain cells, you will lose your memory. Here are two brain stains of two children, same age. On my left is a normal brain of a child who's loved, who's looked after, and he's also nurtured. And on the right hand side, we see a brain of a child who's gone through extreme neglect and abuse. So you can see that notwithstanding the fact that the brain networks are almost identical at birth for these children, but an enriched environment allows the brain to develop significantly Whereas if you deprive the brain of this enrichment, it actually shrinks and has significant problems. If you look at the big dark areas, these parts of the brain will never be functional or connected. So neuroeconomics, and we saw, say, or the world marketing, now what computations are made by the brain in the different decision-making situations and how are these computations Im implemented in your brain? So it's just like a computer. How does these computations map into behavior, be that subjective and individual differences in decision making? I think this is really important point for all the people who go in the field and work on the marketing. We also have experiential blindness. Your, blind, your brain is actually blind to the products and also the material technology that you have not been exposed to. And this experiential blindness is, it really, there are no built-in emotional brain circuits. The emotions are sort of guesswork done by our brain. When you look at two products in the market, your brain really looks at both of these and then tries to make a decision. The conscious part of our brain scans 40 frames per second, whereas the unconscious part of our brain scans 1.2 million scans per frames per second. So you know that which part of the brain is actually going to hijack your decision making, and that is your unconscious mind, because this is where the most activity is taking place. The moment you control your unconscious mind, you now have the ability to bring in the rational reasoning that would allow you to say, I should not buy the third or the fourth car because I don't have the money to afford. So I'm going to show you something and I'll ask you a question to see what really comes to your mind and see how experiential blindness has impacted your brain. Take a look at this and you, you have a few seconds and you can tell me what you actually see. Your brain is making all kinds of, deducing all kinds of gases. Now let me show you what this image actually is. Now that you have looked at it, 
and the image is engraved, you are no longer blind. And if I remove this curtain, you can actually see that image in your brain. Let me show you another example. You can tell me what you actually see. Now these are all really very important aspects of marketing as well as innovation and creativity as to what your brain can actually see that no one else. So this is really your unconscious part of your brain is struggling and also your conscious part is struggling. Let me show what it is. Now let me actually show you back. Now you will have no problem. So this conscious, you know, this uh, experiential blinding, blindness really is also very important. There are many people also, the perception, perception of reality has less to do with what is out there, but rather what is inside us in our brains. There are many people in the world, they actually cannot see alphabets. They see colors. And there are many people in the world who actually cannot see color, they taste color the way their brain is wired. I think doing marketing also, we need to take into account all of these anomalies that may exist in our public, um, public domain. So some people can actually use multiple senses, um, um, their senses to have multiple sensory perceptions. Now I'm going to show you this video. And if you look at this young man, his left hand is being stroked, which he cannot see. Instead of right hand, we put a rubber hand. So at the same time, when the rubber hand is being stroked, his actual hand is also being stroked. So we make this person believe that the rubber hand is actually his own hand. So could we play the video, please? Practice. Uh, here you can see fake hand, focusing on it, there's the real hand, not focusing on it, simultaneous stroking. And there are various ways you can test it. Um. So you can actually make your brain believe something that doesn't actually belong to it. And this is a very, very powerful technique that we are now exploring to connect robotic arms and the artificial arms for people who have lost their arms or legs. But you can see that how plastic your brain is, how dynamic your brain is, and how you can actually modify and modulate and even sometimes manipulate. So the conscious versus unconscious, as I told you, that the conscious part of our brain processes 40 frames, whereas the unconscious part does 1.2 million frames per second. It will always outweigh. It will always take over. Now, if we let our unconscious part of the brain take over, the decision-making will either be impulsive or biased. So they did some pretty cool experiments. They had undergraduate students and graduate students in different rooms. They went to undergraduate students and they told them, told them that you will be having an email conversation with somebody in the other room. And there are, these are the email addresses, Chen, and then Amy, Harvard education. And they said you have a discussion with them, talk to them, and then we will assess as to what you think about these people and their credentials. So the students, graduate students are in one room, the undergraduates are in different rooms, undergraduate students are now having conversation and they're having general discussions. When the discussion finishes, we bring them back and you ask the question, what do you think about the math score of Chen versus Amy? They all scored Chen much higher than Amy. And they were asked about the language, the verbal scores. Amy actually scored higher than Chen. This is the unconscious bias. Because when they were actually brought into the same room, the funny thing is that these students were told that you will meet an Asian American woman by the name of Amy Chan. But they thought that being Chinese, you will have better math scores, and if your name was Amy, you will score highly in verbal scores. 
So this bias is actually built in and then the bias comes in many different shapes and forms that allows your brain to actually, or people to make wrong decisions. But many a times I think that the future really is that can artificial intelligence and, you know, um, allow us to be able to think about whether they could make us less prejudiced and less biased. So if you think about artificial intelligence, the theory and the development of computer systems in able to perform tasks that normally requires human intelligence. Visual perception, speech and force rec uh, uh, face recognition, decision making and translation between languages, your gadgets and devices are doing this already. So we have actually taken many parts of our human brain and our innate propensity and capabilities and we have allowed these machines to learn. So as a result, what is actually happening is we are giving up our biological intelligence to our technical intelligence. And this is rendering us less and less capable of making right decisions and right choices because we are letting Google define our path. But Google actually knows more about me than I know about myself. So I think what is happening is that now that these technologies are decision making and our marketing strategies are also altered. Now machine learning also is an application of an artificial intelligence that enables the system to automatically learn from experience. I don't know how many of you know about AlphaGo Zero. This was the computer that taught itself how to play this game and it defeated every single human being that it played with. So we don't actually have to program these, these super intelligent devices. They can learn themselves and then bring it in anything that we want to do. But one thing that we always thought that yes, these computers and machines can make decisions for us, but data is actually not information. Information is not knowledge. Knowledge is not wisdom. Wisdom requires consciousness. And maybe the humans are the only species that acquire conscious, but I can tell you now, in the next 15 to 20 years, if a super intelligent device gets access to human limbic system, they could have feelings, they could have emotions, and they could do just about anything that we as humans do. What will happen to our marketing strategies then? A super intelligent AI, of course, uh, can we coexist? But this is your future doctor. Your future of medicine will not be run by doctors. So if there are any doctors, please don't threaten me. But I can tell you that the future will be actually run by Google and the IBMs because they are the ones that have data. Now, if I tell you that this medication that you are taking had these side effects, where do you go? You go Google. You actually do Google search and find out what it is. Now let me walk you through and take you 30 years into future and see what the life really will look like. Could we have the volume please? Tragedy may come with new choices. Imagine you've been in a car crash that killed your dog. Is she okay? Is she okay? Or has it? She, Just she listen. Breathe. She breathe. Hey. Your daughter's brain was not impacted by the accident. If you wish to scan your brain for digitization and upload, you have approximately five minutes. Do it! Now imagine the power you wield when you can order a digital copy of your daughter's brain. And do you know what comes next?
Let me also introduce you to Erica. Hello there. May I ask your name? Hi there. My name is Ignacio. It's nice to meet you, Ignacio. So, what country are you from? I'm from Canada. It's pretty cold there, eh? Meet Erica the Android. She, or it, depending on who you ask, is one of the most sophisticated humanoids ever designed. And she's giving us a glimpse of what a year million AI might look like. Modern computers are adding machine. They add very fast, giving the illusion that they're thinking. So reaching the point of singularity, I think the field is really advancing pretty fast. And I can show you what it is that we are contributing to get there. Our lab was the first to actually develop a neuro chip. And on that chip, we coupled brain cells with a semiconductor chip that allowed us to be able to actually not only record and communicate with those brain cells, but also we trained these circuits to exhibit memory. So I think in the future, a memory stick could be really implanted. But where lies the future of human or humanity? We may be at the receiving end if we don't get our act together. So the, the actual um, fabulous abyss and the holy grail of neuroscience has certain challenges. And how does brain work? How to fix it if it goes haywire? Can biological intelligence be simulated by super intelligent AI? And what may happen when we reach that point of singularity? So the first thing was that the really brain is extremely complex. And for you to be able to understand how it functions, we had to acquire the ability to record from large networks of brain cells. And I held the Guinness Book of Record by, during my PhD for 12 brain cells and I thought I walked on water only to realize that I was perhaps the dumbest person because 12 brains would not have allowed you to be able to really um, understand brain function. So we wanted to develop a semiconductor technology where we could record from large networks of brain cells simultaneously and concurrently so that we can map the brain functioning. And if we have, if we tap into information processing capabilities of the brain, actually sky's the limit. That you can design just about anything that is self-controlled or brain controlled. So the idea was that the brain machine interfacing, I think if we are not on board with these innovative disruptive technologies, we are actually left behind. So what we do is that we can take the brain cells out, we develop these incubators, and in these incubators we can keep brain cells alive for weeks to months. And then when we grow these brain cells, they actually grow beautifully, and when they come together, we can, we can record their activity and monitor their activity. And it's really so uh, exciting when the two brain cells come together and one tells the other one, hey, how you doing? What's up? And then we can crack that code of communication between brain cells and try to understand how Mother Nature put these brains and the brain circuits in the first place together. These brain cells are communicating, they come together, and we actually can grow these brain cells on semiconductor chips, and they grow thinking that they are part of the brain. And that was a major, really, milestone. We can create networks that can even fly a uh, an Airbus from Toronto uh, landed in Ottawa because the autopilot actually takes over once your flight is airborne and then from there onwards the pilot doesn't touch the aircraft it is auto uh, an, almost an autopilot so the idea is that can we take that flight simulator and we program it in such a way that these rad brain cells can now fly that aircraft and land it um, from one place to other and we can record the activities of these brain cells for days and weeks. And this allows us to be able to also record from brain slices. And this is an intact brain slice that we take it out. And then when it is interfaced with us, this 3D uh, chip, you can see that the seizures activity can be monitored at the resolution of single cells. The beauty of this thing is that the brain cells are still intact. So it's not that the cells we dissociate in cell culture but this is the intact that Mother Nature would have put it together. So we can record from hundreds and thousands of these brain cells, but you would still say that, yes, it's all good, but brain is 3D. 
you are recording from brain cells that are in contact with the chip, but what about brain cells that sit in different layers? So we developed another technique we call photoconductive stimulation. We grow these brain cells on the semiconductor chip. We pass a laser through the microscope, but these brain cells are labeled with the fluorescent dye. So whenever they fire, like impulses, or they are excited, we are able to actually pick up their activity at the resolution of single cells. Here it is. I never thought I would live long enough to see this. A single laser pulse can activate these signal brain cells, so you're looking at signal neurons, signal brain cells functioning at that level. And what this allows us to be able to do is to monitor the activities of millions of these brain cells. You put it all together, what lies ahead is actually this monkey, for example, has no arm. This visual cortex makes the contact with the palate, and when it makes the, that contact, it talks to its sensory cortex, and if you have a device or a chip that is sitting in the sensory motor cortex, because that is the chip you designed, it picks up the signal and it can then control an artificial limb or prosthetic limb that you have designed. This is one approach, but we wanted to take it into clinic and we are actually about to start the clinical uh, trials for this particular approach. Now, the tragedy is that the children who have seizures and they don't respond to medication. The only option is for a surgeon to go in and take that area out. But the problem there is that it's mostly guesswork. And the child has to stay in hospital, attached to a 30-foot cable. And then the stress that it causes is really enormous uh, for them. And also when you determine seizures, it's often very, very difficult to pinpoint as to where the seizures are coming from. We have developed these 3D electrodes that are completely wireless and they also um, are MR compatible. So when these electrodes are planted in the brain, the patient can go into an MR scanner, the scans are made, and that creates a 3D rendition of the brain and with reference to where the electrodes are. Now if this child ever seizes, so we can put these electrodes in, inside the brain, and it is completely wireless, we stick out through the skull, and every time this child seizes, we can pick up seizure with exquisite accuracy, exactly where the point is. And now this allows the surgeon to design surgery, whereby the surgeon can go and take out those foci with, um, without disrupting other parts of the brain. The other thing that these uh, technologies are allowing us is to, it's really, if you can imagine something, um, any action, it can also be simulated by just imagining. So for example, if you image my brain as I reach out to grab this remote control, the same parts of my brain will light up if I only imagine that I am reaching out to this remote control. So what we can do is that your thought translation machine taps into motor program in a person or animals um, imagining an act and it decodes that distinctive electrical command to device that puts thoughts into action. So what we can actually do is that the, we have these robots in the lab that the students can control whatever now Thomas does here. The robot will pick it up and then we could do is we can bring in very young kids and we ask them to, uh, for example, turn the lights can on. Can you please turn the red light on? And by just, turn the green light? by just thinking, you can turn the light on or off. Um, and, in, and then these young students can actually control these robots. And one of the things we try to practice with them is that we ask them to control a cube in a tunnel. So when they control this tube cube, going up, down, left, right, and then front and back, we can use this approach to actually fly a drone by just thinking about it and coupling this drone to your own brain power. So but this student cannot see the car, but she can now only imagine in her brain where the car has to go in the trajectory. And every time she thinks, she can actually move the car. So the graduate students are a bit better. This car actually drives better than Google. And then finally,
We always make sure that Dean is not around. Otherwise, I could get a lot of, a lot of trouble. So we built in these small little sensors on these drones and they are constantly communicating with the head device and then the person is only thinking about this drone to fly and navigate through the terrain and they can actually uh, communicate regularly and we have a pretty good, pretty good landing in a very tight space. So the idea really... So the idea really is that the future of you know, uh, technology development, commercialization, we live in the best you know, uh, provinces, best country in the world, and the quality of life and standard of living that we have, if we do not become innovation savvy nation, we will be extinct like Albertosaurus, like our dinosaurs in Alberta. So I think it's really important that in terms of marketing and technology that we embrace these cutting edge technologies. Somebody asked Wayne Gresky, how come you have that many assists? And he said, I don't pass Buck to my partner where he is, but where he's supposed to be. If I pass him Buck here, he's skating so fast that actually he misses out. He's gone ahead. So I think in terms of us thinking about marketing and also thinking products and development in the future, we need to embrace, our garments and our other folks have to embrace what lies ahead. We also have to train and teach our children and, and ask them to really adopt careers which will be interdisciplinary and also, um, you know, not in this time but in the future. We also have to remember that if you like cheesecakes and baklava, you don't take it when you go fishing, you take what fish likes. Otherwise you catch cold and no fish. So it's also really important that we need to make sure that we train the future generation of highly qualified individuals who will embrace these novel technologies and they will be well versed in terms of taking these technologies into market. This is what the future uh, companions may look like. You may have to have a prenuptial agreement with them. So you will be able to actually do just about anything except we cannot buy you love. Thank you very much.